Secretary Rogers, on February 26, uh, we now have in the declassified documents, uh, said, you know, everything has gone so well. Your generous hospitality at every step of the way and in every way possible has made our trip here a most pleasant and enjoyable one. To which Prime Minister Joe responded, that's what we should do. But I would believe that there are some places in which we have not done enough. I have found, for instance, a shortcoming that your press pointed out to us. Uh, for instance, for your visit to the Great Wall, we did some preparations we believe were necessary, and it was earnestly honest. But it was quite unnecessary to put up a show in the Ming tombs, because it was quite cold that day. Uh, and then he talks about, so some people got some young children there to prettify the tombs, and it was putting up a false appearance. Your press correspondents have pointed this out to us, and we admit that this was wrong. We do not want to cover up this mis the mistake on this, of course, and we have criticized those who have done this. And then he goes on to discuss these other things, uh, to which President Nixon uh, and others noted that he had his own problems with the press. And so he understood, he understood. We turn now uh, to the contemporary world. This is the world that the Nixon visit helped to create, helped to set in motion. And we have a quite distinguished group of scholars from the Nixon Center in Washington, D.C. and here at USC to talk about different aspects of China's place in the world and the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, in the interest of time, you folks have in your program capsule, bi capsule biographies of these scholars, so I'll not go into details about their work. But I'd like for you, I'd like for you first uh, to greet our visitors from the Nixon Center uh, in Washington, D.C. We have Drew Thompson, Paul Sanders, and Jeffrey Kemp. From USC, in the middle, we have Stanley Rosen, Dan, uh, Stanley Rosen, Dan Lynch, <laughs> and David Kong. In the interest of time, we've been quite brutal with these folks and restricted them to just five minutes for their comments. Each of them possesses uh, really extraordinary knowledge, extraordinary knowledge of many different subjects, but we're going to ask them to highlight a couple, a couple of themes. And first up is Drew Thompson, who's going to be talking about U.S.-China relations. Thank you, Clay. If, if, um, if, if I can buy a rollover minute um, for my five, I'd like to thank the uh, USC uh, China Center and also to thank the Nixon Foundation Ooh. for organizing this and hosting us and bringing us out here. This has been a great experience so far and I really enjoyed the presentations this morning. Um, again, as I'm reflecting on the U.S.-China relationship before coming up here, I mean, it strikes me how much has changed but also how little has changed. Um, but one thing that strikes me is this was a moment that really changed uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China. And, and I've lived in China about 10, over 10 over the last 20 years, and, and you know, President Nixon is revered in China. Uh, so many people see the betterment of their lives uh, as directly attributable to, to his efforts and what they would call his wisdom. Um, and and this, this has a very direct effect in some ways on, on my own work. When I had a meeting a little over a year ago with an assistant minister of foreign affairs, uh, he spent the first few minutes describing um, you know, his experience in the Nixon visit when he was a young high school student and he was uh, called out of school to go with his class to sweep the road of the snow going up to the, the uh, Great Wall. And, and his reflection was that, uh, you know, because of the snow, which is not terribly common in Beijing at the time, he said, you know, we just wanted to make sure that the motorcade had no mishaps, no accidents, and everything went smoothly for this trip because it was so important. And I think that's a legacy that's reflected throughout the U.S.-China relationship. And as I said, you know, you, you've got assistant foreign ministers with these very fond relationships. Uh, at the Nixon Center, the ambassador to uh, China at the time came to give a talk, and we have a photograph on the wall of Deng Xiaoping meeting with President Nixon after he left the White House. And the ambassador stops and looks and says, hey, look, that's me. And it's a young man standing between them, or sitting between them, and he was their translator. So, so I think President Nixon's legacy in China is, is, is very strong to this day. Um, I'm also struck, as, as we heard that narrative, that the U.S.-China relationship this year has been, I think, 
in the dumps. I mean, there, there's just no way we can, we can you know, smile at this relationship so far. Uh, starting in January, mill-mill uh, relations were cut off. There's been great tension. Uh, there's been a lot of rhetoric. Uh, there's a lot going on inside China politically. They've got a party congress coming up in two years. They have a, a major political transition that I think, much the way it does here, their domestic politics are trumping their foreign policy. Uh, and certainly, in, in terms of rhetoric, it's not always rational, but it is what it is. Um, but the relationship has been pretty strained up until about September. And what we had was a number of folks, just like our, uh, our speakers earlier, you know, NSC staffers, went out to China in September, had meetings with President Hu Jintao. Uh, normally, um, NSC staffers aren't going to go and get meetings with the president, but that was a sign of respect. And the Chinese really wanted to send a message to the White House that things were going to get better. And one of the direct consequences of that event in September was a warming of relations and, and a glimmer of hope that things would get better. And, and actually, we've now had some very quiet announcements that President Hu Jintao will visit the United States probably in January of this year, which will mark a pretty significant moment in, in U.S.-China relations today. Uh, we've also had word that military-to-military uh, -military relations are um, about to restart. Secretary of Defense uh, Robert Gates was invited to go to China after being snubbed earlier in the year uh, in his, his planned visit. And that's another signal that, uh, that the Chinese military is seeking to build some strategic trust. Because at the moment, there's significant strategic mistrust between the United States and China. And, and the fact that we've got a presidential visit coming up from China, the fact that we've got military to military relations restarting shows that we're going to start to get back on an upward trajectory for the bilateral relationship after about nine months of, of a very, very difficult period. So the importance of this type of high-level symmetry uh, and, and active management of the bilateral relationship is as relevant today as it was in 1971 and 72. So I think that's before you bring the crook down. Yes. Oh, it sets a good example for the rest of us. It sets, it sets a, high, a high standard. Watch here. <laughs> we we appre appreciate the concise statement. Uh, we turn now to Professor David Kong. Uh, who is the director of the Korean Studies Institute, and hopefully our projector will come on and be, he'll be able to illustrate his talk as well. It's, yeah, it's there's coming. not there's not a whole lot there, but there's one there's there's a funny fun slide. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, China Northeast Asia relations, uh, and I uh, the the general overarching point is that the way that you read about it in the popular press in America about rising China and uh, is this going to be the great titanic battle? Um, I think that in, in East Asia, certainly in Northeast Asia, the discussion's a little bit uh, more complex than that um, because there's the, the, the total outright uh, balance of power politics is mediated by a number of other things going on in the region. Um, so I'll, talk, I'll make one comment about uh, the Koreas and then one comment about Japan. Uh, and the comment about the Koreas, of course, is that for North Korea, China is now more than ever its only friend. Um, and so uh, relations on the peninsula are, are always going to be mediated through the problems between North and South Korea. Uh, and until that's solved, they'll be focused on that first and foremost. And certainly China is more than happy to uh, let South Korea and the U.S. criticize it for its support of North Korea, but that's not going to change. So uh, wish all we want. North Korea is going to be supported by China. What I think is more interesting, though, is South Korea's position, because they're a U.S. ally, uh, they're a strong capitalist democracy, uh, and although the China honeymoon of the last 10 or 15 years is probably over in South Korea, uh, and there's a lot more skepticism now about China's intentions and its motives, in many ways, China ha remains or is becoming uh, once again, uh, the, the only or the most important country for South Korea to have to deal with. And so I have a, I have a slide here. Can you go, go slide number one? Uh, this is sort of interesting because, as we all know, Koreans uh, love education. So uh, what's interesting about this in terms of foreign students studying in the U.S. is that there's a billion Indians and a billion Chinese. Uh, but there's only 48 million South Koreans, and yet they're the third largest number of foreign students in the U.S. And this is always touted as uh, how much they uh, think it's important. Uh, what's interesting, next slide, uh, is that almost the same number is now studying in China. Uh, and these numbers continue to grow, and probably for a number of very obvious reasons, 
uh, very soon there will be more, more South Koreans studying in China than in the United States. Despite the fact, of course, that there are a million Koreans right here in L.A. Uh, it's closer, it's cheaper. Uh, the, the, they all see their business interests as being focused on uh, the China market. So for better or for worse, much of South Korea's future is going to be intertwined with China's future, for good or bad. And there's really no getting around it. And I think this, the number of students is an example of South Koreans changing their viewpoint on uh, China. Whereas literally 20 years ago, nobody thought about China at all in South Korea. Now the Japan question is, I think, more interesting because the Japanese are in the middle of a big debate internally about what they want to do with their country. Uh, it used to be very obvious 20 or 30 years ago that they were the closest U.S. ally. The U.S.-Japan relationship was the most important relationship, bar none, uh, according to one former U.S. ambassador. Uh, they had this great economy. But those things are, are no longer clear at all, how good Japan's economy is, what its aging population is going to do, uh, whether it's as important to the U.S. as the China-U.S. relationship is. Uh, and so the Japanese, as evidenced by the number of uh, domestic political debates going on, in fact, Ozawa just got indicted. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> right. um, are in the midst of a, of a long-term discussion about uh, about what they want to do. And I think that the debate in, Ch in Japan regarding China is, do they compete for regional leadership uh, in East Asia? Or do they gracefully settle into middle power status and emphasize things like the UN, multilateral diplomacy, uh, and a bunch of other uh, very obvious normative goals? Uh, and it's not at all clear which way Japan will go. Certainly, the latest Senkaku's uh, uh, dispute is, is a tempest, um, whether it's in a teapot or the beginning of a, of a much larger conflict or, or you know, approach by Japan is, is yet to be seen. But certainly in Japan itself, there's, there's a lot of discussion both ways about what Japan should try and do and whether it's realistic or not. And one of the most interesting things I found, I was in Japan last, uh, last year for about a month or so, is uh, they have enormous difficulty getting their students to go study abroad. And there are all of these programs in Japanese universities to get their students to go. But this, the younger generation seems pretty happy to just sort of be Japanese, which would bode towards le more middle power and less leadership. Uh, but we will see. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're doing a terrific job of staying, staying on time. We're turning now to Daniel Lynch, and Professor Lynch's current research is focused on elite conceptions, Chinese elite conceptions of China's future. Thanks, Clay. So I've been looking at, is this on? It's on, right? I've been looking at this for probably three or four years now and reading materials published by Chinese elites, academic political elites, going back seven or eight years. And uh, they're thinking on the future, the future of international relations, domestic politics in China, the economy, and so on. And there's really two views. Of course, not everybody thinks the same thing in China as anywhere else. There's really kind of two views about the future of U.S.-China relations. One is that China benefits from U.S. global hegemony and so should continue to do everything in its power to maintain a, a smooth relationship, a harmonious relationship with the U.S. For example, it benefits from being able to keep its currency relatively undervalued, export more to the United States, and so on. The second view, though, is that although China may be benefiting now and, and in the past has benefited from U.S. global hegemony, that is starting to change because as China's power increases, China finds that it's being restricted and even choked by the United States and its allies in a variety of different ways. And that starts to feel unpleasant and uncomfortable. So these people say that it's time for China to, to shake off those uh, shackles, those limitations, and begin to confront uh, the U.S. in various uh, ways, not necessarily militarily, but push back a, a little bit. So what I found is that after about 2008, there's been a shift in the balance to this second uh, category. But something about 2008, I think it was a combination of the Olympics, which were brought off uh, with a, uh, magnificent success, and the belief in a lot of quarters in China that China survived the global financial crisis a lot more uh, successfully than the United States did. So you see a lot more kind of wanting to push back against the U.S. Uh, in, among Chinese writers these days. And you also see it on the ground in actual policy making. Uh, some of uh, our panelists have already mentioned some of the, uh, the difficulties in U.S.-China relations this year, and I think that's a reflection of some of this changing thinking inside China.
So looking ahead then, this group really has sort of three elements to their view of future U.S.-China relations, what they expect the U.S. to do and how it should adjust to China's rise. First, the United States should concede China a sphere of influence in the classic realist sense in Asia, particularly Northeast Asia, where the U.S. has alliances with South Korea and Japan and also a kind of a quasi-alliance with Taiwan. A number of writers will say, will write that, and will tell me on, and, uh, and during trips to China, or even when they come here, that in the 2020s, China will solve the Taiwan problem, period. Okay, so, and there's a variety of reasons, a variety of writers who will say that the United States should ultimately leave the Korean Peninsula, withdraw not only military forces in the Korean Peninsula, but end or end the, uh, the, the security uh, alliance one way or the other. And even some people even speculate, although I've never seen anybody in China write this, did have a, a senior KMT mainlander foreign policy advisor say in May 2009, China would ultimately take the Ryukyu Islands, Okinawa, from Japan. Again, I've never heard anybody in the PRC say this, never seen anybody write it, but um, senior KMT foreign policymaker said China and Taiwan, when they've united, will take back the Ryukyus, which Japan, of course, only annexed in the 1870s. Okay, so that's the first component. Conceding China a sphere in, in Asia. Secondly, accepting the Chinese political model, so-called Chinese political civilization, as the moral equivalent of Western democracy, and no longer bother China and harangue China, try to delegitimize the Chinese state through criticizing its political system. Uh, the people who write in this vein don't say that China's political system now is flawless. There are a lot of things they want to change. They would like to make it less corrupt. They like to make it more just in its policy outputs, more efficient, and so on but they don't want it to become democratic. They want the CCP to remain uh, the authoritarian ruler of China, but maybe make it a lot more like Singapore than it is today, and they want the United States and its allies to respect and accept that. And then thirdly, on that basis, uh, a lot of writers think the U.S. and China will be able to establish a harmonious condominium where these two superpowers jointly manage the world in a harmonious way. So you, most of these people, therefore, who think the United States, uh, China has to confront the United States more don't want and don't anticipate some kind of global war with the United States because they think the United States will be wise enough to recognize rising Chinese power and to back off and to accept it as a reality. So I think the broader issue here is these Chinese writers want to recenter China in world history. They, uh, they look at the last 200 to 500 years of world history, the way it's written, the West is the center of that, the dominant actor, they like to change things. They like China to be at the center. They don't think that necessarily will have to be a conflictual uh, development. But the reality, finally, these are people's aspirations in China, what they would like to see happen, what they hope for, these particular writers, who knows what people in civil society, what peasants want, they don't, they don't write, or if they do, I don't read what they write, I don't get to see what they write. These are what the elites who control that country want, but the reality on the ground will still restrict and constrain them. The reality of, of continuing U.S. power and what U.S. friends and allies in the region actually want. There's a lot of evidence that Vietnamese, Indonesians, Filipinos don't want to be dominated by China or anyone else, and they want the United States to stay in the region I wouldn't be surprised, I'm pretty sure that's true in the case of Japan and Taiwan. I wouldn't be surprised if it's also true in the case of Korea. Thank you. Uh, peasants do write and occasionally they riot as well. So uh, we, we do need to pay, a, do, do need to, uh, pay attention to them. We turn now to Dr. Jeff Kemp, Jeffrey Kemp, who's written on the subject of China, China's expanding influence in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Um, 600 years ago, China was the dominant maritime power in the Indian Ocean and the Middle East. It had a navy su surpassing anything the Europeans had. That vanished when the Chinese decided that the threat was landward and essentially destroyed their navy. They didn't really come back to the Middle East until after the revolution in 49, and then the initial contacts were very unsatisfactory because they tried to work with the Arab communist parties who were very, very unpopular with Arab nationalists. It's only really in the, in the 1980s onwards that, that China's presence in, in, in the Middle East has become more significant, first through arms sales to countries like Iran and Iraq, nuclear cooperation with Iran for a 
a period of years before they essentially stopped. But really, the, the, the reason that, that we talk today uh, so often about China's emerging role in the Middle East is A, because it's a region of extraordinary importance to us. We're fighting two wars there, after all. And second, it's because no matter how you look at it, uh, China's fossil fuel needs, unless there's some miraculous change in the way energy is produced, um, suggests that it's going to need more and more oil and natural gas from all sources in the world. But Middle East oil and natural gas, particularly the oil, is particularly attractive because it's relatively abundant and everyone is very anxious to sell it. Um, so China's demand for Middle East energy is growing. There's no doubt about it, growing dramatically. Most of that energy for the foreseeable future will go to China by ship, by maritime routes, not by land. There, is, there are pipelines, um, gas and oil that are being built from Central Asia into China, but this does not um, match the amount of uh, energy that is going by sea. And one of the concerns, certainly, that the, Ch the Chinese um, military have is that if they were evident in, in a serious confrontation with the United States, the U.S., because it is the policeman of the region, because we do have an, a very formidable presence in the Indian Ocean and the Gulf, could, in theory, uh, choke off China's energy supplies in a time of crisis. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but military people do worry about things like this. But the, the alternative, of course, is that the Chinese have uh, ad adopted a policy in the Middle East which is very low-keyed in terms of projecting their uh, knuckles, showing hard shoulders like perhaps they do in East Asia, they are friends with everybody. It's extraordinary, as indeed is India. Uh, they have very good relations with Iran, with Iraq, with the Palestinians, with Syria, and with Israel. One of their closest uh, military relationships <coughs> is with Israel because of the high-tech value they see in Israeli military equipment. So uh, looked at from a strategic point of view, I think they have calculated that there is no way in the short run they could even consider, consider challenging the United States in any strategic sense. And they don't want to, because after all, we are the policemen. We are providing, if you like, a, a, a service, a, a good. We are protecting these sea lines that come from the Gulf and go to China and elsewhere. And the second point is, it's not just the Chinese who are moving into the Middle East from Asia. The Indians have a huge presence there, as the North, uh, as the South Korea, and many other Asian countries. So it's by no means uh, a, an issue that I, I think we need to lose a lot of sleep about, even though there are disagreements between the United States and China over Iran. But that still hasn't stopped them supporting the latest round of UN sanctions against Iran. And I might add, while the Iranians are desperately trying to get the Chinese to invest in Iranian natural gas, only last week it was announced that Chinese companies are prepared to invest billions in Texas gas uh, shale, which suggests that they are going to go ev anywhere they want to get their energy. The energy demands are immense. The United States, of course, is the biggest consumer, uh, biggest consumer of oil, but China's demands are rising. Uh, China's energy use, of course, now exceeds that of the United States, and its contribution to greenhouse gases exceeds that. We have now a specialist on climate change and the U.S.-China relationship, Paul Sanders. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And l let me first just echo my colleague uh, Drew, Com Drew Thompson's uh, comments at the beginning. We very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. We're excited to be here as one of the co-sponsors of the event together with our uh, 
uh, longtime friends uh, at the Nixon Foundation and our new friends uh, at the U.S. China Institute. Uh, Mr. Higby, in his comments during the last session, mentioned that one of the uh, original goals of the opening to China was to balance against the Soviet Union, which is a, uh, an area of my uh, particular expertise. And it's, it, it's an element of the, uh, the strategy that really succeeded. Uh, what I think is interesting, however, and it's something that's interesting in many areas of, of foreign policy, uh, and it's what I'll talk about now, is one of the unintended consequences, uh, perhaps, of what happened. And if we look at, uh, actually, economic statistics comparing that time uh, and this time, uh, it, it's really quite interesting. In 1972, China was around, I think, 2.5% of the global economy. Uh, the Soviet Union was around 8% of the global economy. And you find, if you look at 2010, that that is basically flipped. Uh, Russia's about 2, 3 percent of the global economy now. China's about 7, 8 percent. Uh, and it led, as uh, uh, Clay uh, uh, mentioned, uh, to this, and Jeff also mentioned, this uh, very rapid growth in energy consumption, which has really fueled, uh, uh, of course, China's uh, massive economic uh, growth. Uh, and it has, of course, also led to the very considerable growth in China's greenhouse gas emissions, which in addition to its energy consumption uh, also now uh, exceeds uh, the United States. Uh, and this has some uh, very profound implications as we move forward uh, and think about dealing with the problem of climate change. Uh, the, uh, the first uh, of these implications, and it's come up a little bit before, uh, is, uh, and Clay, actually, you mentioned the, the riots, uh, is the degree to which the Chinese government is uh, uh, very sensitive to domestic unrest, uh, eager to maintain economic growth, and really to avoid doing anything uh, that could contribute to instability. Uh, this puts a very great pressure uh, on the Chinese government uh, to avoid accepting any internationally binding limits uh, on its greenhouse gas emissions that could result in slower economic growth, fewer jobs, uh, potentially uh, more, uh, more unrest. Uh, if you think about, well, how do you reduce emissions uh, without slowing uh, economic growth, Really, the only way to try to do anything like that uh, is to very, very substantially increase China's energy efficiency. But how would you go about that? Uh, that's an enormously expensive undertaking. Uh, and to reduce China's uh, uh, energy, or to increase China's energy efficiency and reduce its uh, emissions on the scale that would be required really to stop and reverse climate change in a reasonable time frame, uh, you're talking about a uh, Marshall Plan scale uh, of international investment uh, in China. Uh, which I think if we look at uh, uh, just the domestic politics of the United States, not talking about uh, anywhere else, uh, seems like something that's really uh, extremely unlikely, uh, in my view, to happen. So as we're moving forward, we have this situation where it's really difficult to envision China's energy consumption uh, uh, or China accepting limits on its greenhouse gas emissions. It's difficult to envision uh, really steep increases uh, in energy efficiency. Uh, and what we get as you project this out forward uh, is a China that already has greenhouse gas emissions larger than the United States and are growing at a significantly faster rate. Uh, so that if you imagine, you know, let's say the United States by 2030 becomes a zero emission economy, which I don't think anybody uh, really realistically thinks we could do, but let's, uh, you know, imagine that we do that. Uh, it, it's very likely that China will make up for or possibly more than make up for uh, 
uh, the uh, departure of all American emissions uh, from, uh, uh, from the atmosphere. So a, a very difficult problem to try to address and I think an interesting, uh, perhaps unintended consequence uh, of 1972. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we turn now to uh, Professor Stan Rosen here at USC, who is an expert on Chinese popular culture and on American popular culture in China. Thank you, Clay. Uh, Clay has asked me to, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cold. Uh, Linda is monitoring me, so I will talk until she cuts my microphone off, which should be about five minutes. Um, popular culture in China, American culture in China is what I want to talk about, but I want to take maybe the first minute to talk about some of the things that other people have talked about directly or indirectly. For example, I happen to be reading the Washington Post blog, The Fix, on Washington Today. The lead article, one of the lead articles, were the new advertisements from Republican candidates uh, entitled, as Ad Wars Heat Up, Republicans Eye China as Their Secret Weapon. It's almost like the Nixon visit in reverse. China is now the secret weapon to win control of the House and perhaps the Senate uh, because the polls have shown very clearly that a very, very large percentage of, of the American public think that the economic stimulus has been used primarily uh, to create jobs in China, or at least has been wasted. So China, in spite of the short term, I might disagree slightly with Drew Thompson, in spite of the short term benefits of the Gates visit and restoration of military relations and so on, these things are, go back and forth, nine months here, nine months back. I don't see a long term benefit Again, if you look at polling in the United States, the American public feels, uh, I think it's the latest Washington Post, ABC News poll, uh, it was something like 43% uh, feel that China, this century is China's century. 30-something percent feel it's the American century. And this has been increasing constantly. So I think this kind of tension in the relationship uh, is going to continue. And I agree with some of what Dan Lynch was saying. People in China. Um, elites in China, military elites, see this happening and are lobbying the government for that. The other thing I would mention um, is that uh, Chinese Central Television had a very interesting documentary in light of the first panel called Mimi Fang Wen, The Secret Kissinger Visit to China, where they interview Zhou Enlai's aides. They have Mao's nurse who had dinner with him every, every night. Uh, and you get it from the Chinese side, but also interview Henry Kissinger, Winston Lord, Alexander Haig from the American side about the secret preparations. It's wor worth watching. I must say, though, um, when Henry Kissinger was speaking, I read the Chinese subtitles because I couldn't understand what he was saying. But, but um, it's well worth watching. And the National Archives has just put out Richard Nixon's visit to China in 1972, which is widely available if you want to buy it from the archives. And that's mostly NBC News, John Chancellor, Barbara Walters, uh, talking about the trip with some of the video material we saw here. Um, in terms of the popular culture issue, uh, tremendous changes in China since 2001. And I don't have PowerPoint because I can't do a PowerPoint in five minutes. But if you look in the early 2000s, the Chinese magazines like Sanlian Shanghua Zhou Kan, Sanlian Life Weekly were all about just beginning to talk about how people were getting rich in China. Who are the rich people? How do they get that way? When I was in China in September, um, China Weekly, the cover story was on a, another survey, but this was on the people who own private planes in China. Uh, China has the second largest number of billionaires. And the laws are still not caught up in China because most of these pri private planes are not registered. Uh, it turns out that the fine for flying a private plane in China is less than the cost of registering a private plane in China. So people are just, so that's, uh, they're really having some growing pains, but it's very interesting. Uh, you look at American popular culture, uh, the Chinese equivalent of soap, soap opera digest, uh, this is Dian Xuju, uh, cover story, September, Big Bang Theory. You can find any American sitcom in China completely. They have all 20 seasons of The Simpsons available there. You cannot find anything past season 13 normally in the United States. I brought copies of Seinfeld, South Park, the Chinese editions of them. Um, so they're very much aware of American popular culture. In fact, this interesting survey, um, unpublished in the open press, but a restricted circulation survey, uh, on Western visual cultural products, whether they propagate Western political concepts and lifestyles, is university students in China. Um, over 82% said yes. Uh, only 11.6% said no. But when they were asked, do you identify with these cultural concepts for American visual culture, uh, 
only 17% said they don't identify with them. So American popular culture is very successful in China. And when you look at surveys, even of political systems in China, uh, this survey, which is the Shokuyuan Academy of Social Sciences and some other surveys, they show a surprising amount of support for the American system of separation of powers because a lot of people in China, uh, one minute already, okay, and I haven't gotten to a lot of like Supergirl and Rolling Stone, and that's okay, come take my class. So basically, what, what you're finding out is that the American political system is seen sometimes in terms of separation of powers, for example, as the only way to fight corruption. It can't be done just by the Communist Party itself. Tremendous animosity toward American foreign policy and the fear that they're trying to keep China weak, but tremendous support for American popular culture and many aspects of American society and even American politics. Thank you very much. We have two members of our panel who have planes to catch and unfortunately are going to have to depart. Um, and we definitely want to thank those members of the panel, uh, Professor Kong and Professor Lynch. Sorry. Where are you going? Okay. Uh, but we have time, if I could ask everybody to hold on for a moment, we have time for 15 minutes of questions. And I'd like to begin by asking the panel, there was a lot of emphasis on points of conflict. And Paul, for example, also highlighted uh, some possibilities and the challenges to cooperation. And I was wondering if members of the panel could address that. Uh, where are we now cooperating? Uh, so, for example, with regard to the sea lanes and fighting piracy and these kinds of things, where are the United States and China now finding ways to work together? Um, I, think, I think the issue of the issue of Taiwan is is still as much a part of the U.S.-China relationship today as it was in '72, and it remains pretty much in its same state. I mean, I mentioned the downturn in U.S.-China relations this year, and. and I mean, not that uh, you've ever got, you know, unidirection here. I mean, it's definitely cyclical. But, I mean, the cause for uh, the downturn in U.S.-China relations was arms sales to Taiwan, which is a longstanding U.S. policy. But there's a great deal of cooperation going on in other areas. Um, and there's the intention to cooperate in a lot more areas. And I think that's most important is the promise of the relationship as opposed to just what there is. I mean, there's, there's active collaboration on climate change, but also some of the security issues that we talk about. Um, there's a lot of dialogue going on between the U.S. and Chinese administrations on some of the toughest cases in U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Iran, North Korea, uh, security around the world, uh, maritime piracy, you just gave the example. Um, but also you've got issue areas where we don't talk so much about it in the press. Remember in 2008 when China was feeling its oats, there were you know full page ads in the uh, major newspapers about China's investments in Sudan. And actually China, under significant pressure and dialogue from the U.S., uh, began to use its leverage with uh, the government of Sudan to change some of its practices in Darfur, reach agreements with its rebels in the south. Um, and it's an example of where the U.S.-China relationship can deal effectively with uh, third country issues that in the past we've really sort of struggled with, but now uh, State Department officials will tell you quite openly how pleased they were with China's cooperation on that particular issue. Yeah, uh, just a moment. It's just relevant to what he said, that's all. Okay, if we can just hold on for a moment. Uh, other members of the panel? Uh, no, I, 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 I agree with Drew, and certainly in the, in the Middle East, with the exception of Iran, where there have been significant differences, the Chinese are very much uh, on the you know, on the, the co-op, let's be cooperative uh, pitch. And the piracy issue, I think, that you both brought up is, is, is critical here because, um, I mean, this is just the thin end of the wedge. I mean, the pirates that we're talking about are the ones off the coast of Somalia. But, you know, the Indian Ocean is a large ocean, and I think there is great fear that if, uh, for instance, Pakistan were to implode or something catastrophic were to happen, there, then the whole issue of the sea lanes would become much more immediate and much more pressing. And on, on that point, I see no reason why they would not cooperate with us. 
Paul. Let me answer the question maybe in kind of a, a roundabout uh, direction, which is by drawing a contrast. Uh, I, I do a lot of work on, uh, on Russia and the U.S.-Russian relationship. And I think it's really very interesting to contrast the U.S.-Russian relationship with the U.S.-China relationship. And there's no question in the U.S.-China relationship that there are a number of challenges, obstacles, uh, and limits. Uh, and it's very complex. Uh, what's interesting when you compare the two is that, yes, maybe there are some limits on the upside, uh, but there are also certain limits on the downside. Uh, which you don't really have, uh, at least at this point, uh, in the U.S.-Russian relationship because the American-Chinese relationship is so deep, and particularly the e economic relationship uh, is so deep and intense uh, that both sides really need to think twice uh, before they take steps that could seriously compromise the relationship. And that's just not something we see so much in the case of Russia. And if we look back uh, just a couple of years ago to uh, Russia's uh, war in Georgia, uh, we were really in a period of very steep decline in that relationship, and it wasn't clear where it would bottom out. So that's uh, a backwards uh, uh, way of uh, maybe talking about the upside. You, uh, Professor Gene Cooper. Thanks. Gene, um, uh, maybe you could stand. And is address it the Professor Thompson? Drew. Drew Thompson. Um, uh, in, in the preface to what you were just about to say about China's international cooperation, uh, you dropped a comment on the US Taiwan relationship as not having changed much since 1972. Well, I mean, it's still a central factor in the relationship. It's well, still a central factor in the relationship, but one of the, point, the only point that I would make is that the relationship between China and Taiwan today is a very, very different kettle of fish than it was in 1972. That the Chinese have also, I think, been remarkably cooperative in terms of establishing the basis for long-term relationships and long-term cooperation with their fellow countrymen on Taiwan. Yes, they still pissed at the United States for selling arms to Taiwan, but they've already, I mean, begun the process of absorbing Taiwan into the broader economy of China in a way that, that recalls a similar experience of absorbing Hong Kong into the South Chinese economy. And the degree of economic cooperation between across the Taiwan Straits nowadays is, is really unprecedented compared, certainly compared to what existed in 1970. So let's get a That's the only point I want. Let's get a response first from uh, Drew, but other members of the panel who might choose to respond. There is now $100 billion of trade each year between the mainland and China, and of course Taiwan has invested more than $50 billion in China. I mean, without a doubt. The cross straits relationship has had tremendous improvement since Mind Joe was elected in 2008. Um, Clay and I were commenting. Clay and I were, were commenting earlier about you know, just the, the convenience of direct flights between the mainland and Taiwan, which kind of you know occurred without a great deal of fanfare. Yet for you know what 60 years, you 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 know you couldn't get there directly. I mean, the three links um, was sort of a you know a. a hardly celebrated because it just seemed normal and natural. I, I think the concern, though, is that there is still tremendous strategic mistrust between the U.S. and China, and Taiwan is still at the heart of it. Uh, there's still the perception in, in China that the U.S. is using Taiwan to keep them weak, to keep them separated. Uh, it's still cause for concern. As I said, with the arms sales, we still have Ma Zhou at the moment asking for now F-16s, which you know, the Chinese are threatening might be a red line. Uh, there's, uh, there are developments in the relationship that makes it more complicated. The big question is, Maing Zhou comes up for election in 2012. You've got new leadership taking place in Beijing in 2012. You've got new leadership here in Washington in 2012, potentially. And all of these political transitions occurring at the same time, plus in Japan, plus in South Korea, plus in a number of other places. Um, 
the potential for miscalculation is significant. The real concern that the Chinese have about Taiwan is that the Ma Ying-jeou administration has been great. They like having the KMT in power and they'd like to cement it, but they're uncertain how. They're worried, however, that whatever they give Taiwan now in terms of inducements to, to draw closer to the mainland uh, might come back to haunt them should a uh, uh, independence-leaning administration uh, take power in a future uh, election. So, so I don't think it's a resolved issue at this point. Would anyone care? Uh, anyone want to touch Taiwan? I mean, very briefly, I would agree very strongly with what you said. We certainly don't we have the two extremes in some ways. We, we have the ABN, the Chen Shui-bian administration, which was anathema to China. And then you have the Ma Ying-jeou, which was a breath of fresh air. But a lot of people in Taiwan are not yet convinced that that is necessarily good for Taiwan in the long run. So we won't know until the transition, the next transition. We have the mayoral elections coming up in late November. And some people in the DPP at least think they're going to win all five of the contested elections. We'll see. Um, if that is the case, which I don't think will happen, but if that is the case, then it's going to put the KMT on the defensive uh, in terms of their China policy. So there are a lot of imponderables, and we, don't, we won't know until certainly after the, what happens in 2012, uh, at least to get some idea of where we're going. Because we have these two extremes, ABN on one side and Ma Ying-jeou on the other side, uh, making a big push. That was his campaign pledge, uh, this common market with China. Let's see what actually happens in terms of success or not. I'd like to move away from Taiwan for just a moment. Uh, Stan made some reference to the presence of China in the current American electoral season. Uh, the number of uh, commercials that various candidates are running uh, accusing opponents, always accusing opponents, nobody is bragging uh, about this, of shipping jobs uh, to China. and so. That's one question, is the place of China in the American political environment. But also, what is the place of the United States in the Chinese political environment? We've had Dan Lynch discuss some of this. We've had Stan, Stan Rosen discuss some of this. But if you'd like to take that on. I mean, China wasn't an issue in the 2008 presidential election. I mean, I was given a sort of a task, if you will, from my colleagues at the Nixon Center. They said, what are the candidates' positions on both sides? And I'm just you know, going through uh, speeches, and you just couldn't find a mention of China anywhere in any of their speeches. And if it was, it was kind of offhand. It was just a non-issue. And trying to compare the difference, we, we, we found ourselves doing almost traditional Paganology, looking at the, the, you know, the, sort of the potential staffers for, for, for the different candidates to sort of get a sense of how it might play out. It just wasn't an issue. Um, this being a midterm election, I think it's, gonna, it's already a bigger issue than it was in 2008. The question is, how big is it going to get? Um, it seems like anything is, is in play. Uh, China is a very convenient um, target, uh, particularly for congressional election practices. It's been very difficult for the American political establishment to convince the American public at a local level the value of a U.S.-China relationship that's strong, stable, and, and, and mutually beneficial. Uh, in some ways, I think there's a concern here, and it's a similar concern in China, that the bilateral relation, economic relationship benefits corporations but not workers and individuals. And that's a narrative that I think is going to continue. But if you look at the U.S. business community, they're very supportive of the relationship. They lobby hard against you know, what you might consider anti-Chinese legislation on the Hill. But you know the average citizen in America is, is, is much less enamored. So I think that's going to play out in these very locally focused elections uh, because they're midterm. Now maybe the question is, you know, how will it play in, in 2010? Uh, anyone want to take on where America fits in in the Beijing political dynamic with, with their transition coming up? Oh, uh, well. Other than what Dan said and what I said, I'm not sure how much more I, I can add. Um, you can go through the whole spectrum from those who look upon the United States as kind of the evil, their own axis of evil, to those who are enamored with the U.S. Uh, Liu Xiaobo, who just won the Nobel Peace Prize, has been vilified in some quarters because um, years and years ago he said, uh, in terms of about China and the West and Chinese modernization, if China had been a colony of the West for 300 years, it would be a lot better off than it is today. Um, and so obviously 
it was ironic and around the common and so on. But but you have the China can say no people, the uh, China is, is unhappy people, the neocon nationalists in a way. You have the whole spectrum. Uh, very hard to get actual public opinion in China. But but I think again, looking at so called Nebu or internal surveys, it seems very clear that it's the foreign policy of the United States um, that nobody is defending. But the domestic policy and even the American political system, as well as American popular culture, is very much supported by many people, even if they don't understand uh, the American political system very well. Um, so that clear bifurcation, I think, is, is there. Anyway, it's much more nuanced than I have time to talk about. You have to trust me on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd like to invite questions from the audience. Please, Professor Holtz. <laughs> well, Russia snuck in. <laughs> Second point is that 25% of Chinese GDP is going on to be remitted to the U.S. and China, and China is worth it. So we think that China is standing very well in every way, and I would say it is a complement of political efficiency and accomplish our focus. Does anyone want to treat that as a question? It was... <laughs> Quick observation: um, The U.S. and the Chinese, of, uh, the U.S. and the European perspective of of China, especially in the economic sector, because that's really where Europe's focused. I mean, they're not really looking at China from a security angle. Um, it's been somewhat different from the U.S. Mm -hmm. up until about a year ago, two years ago. Um, and again, historically, in the modern era, the U.S. has run tremendous deficits with China whereas Europe has had a surplus. And, and basically the U.S. was financing that surplus with China because China was, was maintaining essentially a balance of trade. And around about two, three years ago, that began to shift and, Ch and China began to become a surplus country. In other words, they were running, or the Europeans and the U.S. had deficits with China, trade deficits. And then the European tune started shifting and we started seeing a little more of an American-style foreign policy towards China out of the Europeans. And, and we see that more and more now, where the US and Chinese are very much on the same page. We have a G5, essentially. We have a G5, essentially, where there's active coordination on policy towards China. And, and one of the areas where that's had a, a fairly significant result was uh, the indigenous innovation policy. Basically, Chinese government departments were opening uh, a catalog system of of approved buyers for government contracts, and it was limited to, to, to local companies, and it was basically a not WTO compliant, exclusionary, mercantilist practice. And and the Europeans and the U.S. coordinated very closely, and, and China essentially backed down on that. So so I think we're increasingly on the same page, um, and that means we don't have to fuss about Europe as much as we as we maybe once did about you know, Europe taking its own path. I'll say uh, briefly two things. One is is just to refer back to my colleague Drew Thompson's comment uh, about who benefits. And uh, I, I'm not going to take a position on who benefits because actually I don't think it actually matters who benefits to this argument. What matters is who people think benefits uh, and, uh, and what they do on that basis. Uh, and I think that's what we're, what we're really uh, talking about. It, it's really a question, perhaps, uh, as much of perception uh, as of reality. You know, as far as Europe is concerned, if I had 10 minutes instead <laughs> of five, you know, it, it's an interesting question, what are the implications for Europe about what I was saying uh, about uh, what I believe to be uh, the direction China is going to go on, on, on climate change? If what I said happens, you know, there's no way that the United States is going to make any uh, uh, particular meaningful commitment uh, to reduce its emissions if China doesn't. I don't think China will, so the United States won't either. Uh, and I think it, it's kind of an interesting question as we go forward, uh, particularly in a time of economic uncertainty. Uh, to what degree are Europeans and European public opinion who have been uh, uh, leaders in this area in, in terms of accepting these commitments, H how sustainable uh, is that going to be in Europe uh, for political leaders? Question mark. 
Um, I think, you know, one of the real test cases is Afghanistan, where the Europeans do have uh, a presence, where we are committed up to the hilt, but we're meant to be withdrawing next year, where China has growing economic interests. It's, after all, next door. Um, and this, I think, is going to ultimately raise the, the very fundamental question, particularly for the United States, but also the Europeans. How, for how much longer are we going to essentially police huge swathes of the world all the way from the, <laughs> the Indian Ocean through the South China Seas at a time when we do face enormous domestic uh, problems and a, f a fiscal overstretch that is quite scary. And people are, are asking, you know, why should we be doing, why should we be in, in Korea when Korea has one of the most robust uh, economies in Asia? I mean, it, there, th these, these fundamental questions of what I would call a nascent sort of neo-isolationism that you find in both the right and the left in Washington and take the Tea Party. I mean, there's very few members of the Tea Party who are talking about expanding American power overseas and increasing the defense budget. They're totally different from the neocons who were dominant in the Republican uh, mindset several years ago. This, I think, is one of the big debates this country is going to have in the next 10 years. Well, I'd only say, from what I've seen, and I haven't studied it as much as you have, what I've seen of the Tea Party people, they're all over the place, from those who want to increase the defense budget to those who are complete isolationists. It's not a unified movement, it doesn't seem it's, like. It's, it's not, but by and large, the Tea Party takes its advice from a think tank in Washington called the Cato Institute, <laughs> which is such a, and the neocons took their advice from another Washington think tank American. called the American Enterprise American Institute. Institute. And there you see the two polar opposites of the Republican Party. And apparently not listening to the Nixon Center. No. Or, or not. We're, in the, we're in the middle. Some, 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 some listen. Some, 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 some listen to us. Some listen. Uh, well, and nobody knows about Los Angeles, apparently, either. But uh, one, one final but very important question. Uh, that was touched on very briefly, and that's the question of human rights. Uh, and this was not an important issue raised during President Nixon's 1972 visit, but it, of course, has loomed very large. Uh, human rights is part of the discussion involving Taiwan. It's part of a lot of different discussions involving China. What is the place of human rights today in American policy towards China? Um, I mean, again, to, to link us back to that uh, earlier panel, I mean, the Shanghai communique it remains a very durable document. Uh, and there's a line in there, and I, I will paraphrase it, essentially that we, both sides, recognize that each side has a different political system. Um, and, and again, this is mutually agreed to language. We have our system, they have their system. Uh, I have a couple of friends who are human rights lawyers in China, and you know even the ones who you know who, who lean one way on the spectrum and the other way on the spectrum, they both agree that uh, they define their human rights differently than we do, and I think we have to recognize that. Now, I mean, the case of Liu Xiaobo, that's an entirely different case, but I mean, I, I think that there is a struggle within China um, between different groups that that see a different way to stabilize their society. I mean, again, China is not as strong internally as I think you know, we might perceive from the outside. We saw the slide earlier of the, the overpass in Shanghai and one of the Huangpu bridges. And, and you know, that's what we see. But the reality is it's an, it's, there's instability there, there's uncertainty there, and there's internal um, low-grade conflict. And that reflects um, basically a rather unsettled political system and how individual rights are protected versus the rights of the group are protected um, is, is an active debate in China. And it's very difficult for us to take our values and apply it to them, in my personal opinion. But I think many people within the Chinese system recognize that certain values are, are essentially universal. Uh, and and the, the trick is, is, is how do they institutionalize them and make them as durable as possible. 
Yeah, I, uh, following up on that, I think there are two basic questions which Drew has, I think, touched upon. One is what should U.S. government policy be? Um, should the strat when Hillary Clinton went to China early on and downplayed human rights in favor of climate change and other issues, she was vilify vilified by some people in the human rights community. Other people supported that if you want human rights to be pursued in China, you can't do it in a very heavy-handed way. Um, I remember Susan Lawrence years ago writing for the Forest Economic, no, actually at that time for U.S. News and World Report, wrote a very interesting piece in which she argued that all these efforts on human rights have basically helped 20 people in China, um, but the costs have led to hundreds of other, other people being incarcerated. She, again, was vilified for saying something like that, but it is a legitimate debate. Where do we focus on human rights from a governmental level? And then there's the NGOs, and there are other kinds of human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch Asia, and so on. But what should the government's uh, role be? The second question, uh, which again was touched on by Drew, is what is the status of the Chinese government in terms of stability? If you, if you read Susan Shirk, China, fragile, China's fra China Fragile Superpower, which is very similar to what you're saying, then you have a government subject to control by pub public opinion. Uh, they're afraid of being overthrown, 1989 happening again. That's one view. But then there are plenty of other people who are arguing the Chinese government is much more in control. If you look at surveys, and again, surveys are questionable in societies like China, but you find that uh, a majority feel that the Chinese government has done very well. They've made China stand up in the world. A new book coming out by James Riley from Columbia University Press, I reviewed it from the manuscripts, so I know about it, is on China's Japan policy and the role of public opinion, in which he makes the argument, very criti cr critical of Susan Shirk and Peter Grease and others who have argued that this new nationalism is, is overtaking the government, basically showing through case studies how the Chinese government has actually been in charge of Japan policy and manipulated it. A much stronger government a much stronger state than comes out in books like Susan Shirk. So again, there's a debate in the academic community and a debate in the U.S. government over what our strategy should be toward human rights and how stable or unstable the government is. There's no easy answer. Uh, I'll maybe add something, Jeff, unless you want to. No. No. Uh, just a, a, a brief comment, which is uh, a little bit similar to what Professor Rosen was saying, but uh, uh, perhaps said in a slightly different way. Uh, and it's really a broader point about American foreign policy. I think it's not just a question of, of China. Uh, for me, the, the central question is, you know, wh what can we do? What's the most effective way uh, to, to do it? Uh, and, uh, and what's the goal uh, uh, of trying to press China or, or any other country uh, on, on human rights? Uh, and uh, you know, there's been a very long-standing debate uh, on this issue in U.S. foreign policy, not just related uh, to China, but related to uh, to a lot of other places. And there is, I think, uh, on one hand, a view that we should strive through our own conduct uh, to be a model for others, uh, and, and that that's the most effective way uh, to influence them. And there's another view that we should uh, go and tell other people uh, what they should be doing, uh, and that that's a more effective way. And you can tell by the way that I put the two of them, you know, maybe which direction uh, I lean in. Uh, but it's a it's a very difficult question, uh, and I don't think it's ever one that's really going to be settled uh, in, in our debates. There's a lot of unsettled questions in the U.S.-China relationship, uh, human rights, trade, all of these sorts of things. We haven't had time to touch on the fullest range of these discussion, uh, these, these issues, but I really hope that you will join me in thanking this wonderful panel for exploring so much in such a compressed way. I'd also like you to join me in thanking our co-sponsors for this event, uh, the Nixon Center, represented by three panelists here, and the Nixon Foundation.